Hello, my name is Jeff Kindhart, and today I'm going to talk to you about successful transplant production. Why would we use transplants? Transplants are commonly used in temperate climate areas like Illinois for many reasons. First, they allow growers to achieve a higher percentage germination for expensive seed. Some hybrid seed can cost as much as a dollar per seed. It is important that we get all of them to germinate that is possible. Additionally, by using transplants, we gain about four to six weeks on the growing season. For example, setting a four-week-old tomato transplant instead of direct seeding the tomato seed in the field after the danger of frost has passed will gain a grower four weeks or even more. This allows for earlier harvest, and almost all growers will agree that earlier harvested vegetables are generally both easier to market and typically command a higher price in the marketplace. Transplants can be produced in a variety of different methods, but typically in Illinois they are raised in either hotbeds or greenhouses. A hotbed, like seen on the left, is typically a low profile box with a slanted top that is skinned with either glass or polycarbonate or some other type of light transmitting material. Thermostatically controlled heat cables are most commonly used to heat hotbeds, although composting manure and or composting plant debris can also be utilized to provide heat to the seedlings inside of the hotbed. Greenhouses are by far the most common method of raising transplants in Illinois. New growers will occasionally try raising transplants in their house, oftentimes in the basement that they have rigged up supplemental grow lights in, and in almost all cases the production of transplants inside of a residential structure results in very poor quality transplants for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is temperature management, and the second, which is most important, is failure to provide adequate light for transplant development. This process is typically going to begin with germination of seed, although there are some cases such as garlic or sweet potato where we may be using a vegetative propagule to start the transplant. In almost all cases, seed is going to be the beginning step. Seeds can germinate in two different fashions. The top is the one that we're most familiar with and that's called epigeous germination where the cotyledons actually come up out of the ground. This is the green bean or the tomato or the pumpkin most of the crops that you're familiar with are probably going to have epigeous germination and we only point this out because if you will look over on the right hand side you'll see two examples where the seed coat has hung on to the cotyledons and it's important to go back through and pick that seed coat back off of those cotyledons otherwise the transplant that's developing may have difficulties growing a stem Seed germination requires several factors. The seed that is being used must be viable and have a living embryo. The seed must be placed in an environment that has the proper water temperature, oxygen, and light levels for the species that is being grown. The seed must also be free from dormancy. While dormancy is not an issue for growers using purchased seed, it can be a problem for some species if growers are saving their own seed. This graph shows the importance of temperature on seed germination. And at optimal temperatures, the percent seed germination is maximized and the days for emergence is minimized. As one gets either warmer or colder than the optimal temperature, the percent germination declines and the number of days it takes for emergence to occur is lengthened. What is the optimal temperature? It varies from species to species. The chart above shows the optimal temperature for several vegetable crops. And there are a variety of these types of charts that are available on the internet or in sources such as Knott's Vegetable Growers Handbook. This chart shows the percentage germination at various temperatures and the number in parentheses is showing you the number of days that it takes for seed emergence. 
in most cases when we're trying to raise transplants we would like to have the maximum amount of seed emergence in the minimum number of days possible. Proper water and oxygen levels are important for successful seed germination. These will largely be determined by the choice of media the grower is using. Plug mix is most commonly used for seed germination. Plug mix and or seed starter as it is sometimes called is a media that is finer in texture than the media that will be used for growing the plant on as it becomes larger in size. The finer texture helps ensure good seed and soil contact. This is important for high levels of germination. For some crops like cucurbits, things like cucumbers or gourds or squash, jiffy pellets like seen in the upper right can be used successfully. Hydroponic growers may often opt for the use of rock wool blocks like is seen in the bottom center picture. And in many cases, if we're going to raise those plants hydroponically, they may spend their entire life in rock wool type media. Again, growers using purchasing, purchased seed will not normally need to worry about dormancy. However, growers that are saving their own seed need to make sure that the species that they are using either does not have an issue with seed dormancy or that we have taken the steps to alleviate that dormancy. And there are a couple of types of dormancy that are commonly seen. One is a hard seed coat. Many of the gourds would have a hard seed coat and this is easily rectified by either nicking the seed with sandpaper or a file. It's called scarification. Other types of dormancy that can exist. A few species have immature embryos and this simply means after we collect the seed we need to store the seed in a warm area for a period of typically two to four weeks to allow the embryo to finish maturing so it's capable of producing a new offspring. There are some other species that have internal physiological dormancy and this means that when the seed is first harvested we can't just plant it back and get a successful germination to occur. This is alleviated by stratification normally and to stratify seed we simply place them in a baggie with moist sphagnum peat moss and store them in the refrigerator for a period of typically two to three months depending on the species that we're working with. Seeding methods vary by both growers and the species being grown. One of the methods for seeding is to simply broadcast the seed over the top of the flat. This method is commonly used by small growers and it is also oftentimes used for small seeded species. In some cases if we've got really really fine seed we may actually mix the seed with sand and broadcast the resulting sand seed mixture so that we get more uniform spread of the seed across the flat. The biggest problem with broadcasting is that if a disease is to develop within the flat it can rapidly spread from plant to plant resulting in the mortality of the entire flat. A preferred method is to sow the seeds in rows even if we're sowing into just an open flat sow the seeds in individual rows. This makes it less likely that we will have mortality of an entire flat of seed should we have disease development occur. We also see direct seeding where we're going to place an individual seed into an individual cell or pot. And this can be done into plug trays or things like jiffy pellet pots or groden blocks that we looked at previously. Broadcasting again works well for small seeded species and if you will look on the left everything is very good. If you look at the slide on the right you can see that disease damping off in this particular case has started in two different areas of this flat and it's rapidly going to result in the mortality of the entire flat. Had those plants been placed into rows rather than broadcast entirely across the surface it's less likely that the entire flat would have perished. Broadcasting in rows reduces again disease movement and many growers will actually use these seeding flats like you see here 
where we have the individual rows separated one from another by the plastic channel that the media is contained in. This greatly reduces the likelihood of disease spreading across the entire flame. Here is an example of a plug tray that the seeds have been placed into individual cells and you can see the transplant that results. While this method works great and is very common for large growers that have some specialized equipment we'll look at in a minute, it can be a bit monotonous for smaller growers. There are a number of aids or devices that can be used to assist in the seeding process. Here are some examples of plug trays in the upper left that are commonly used for direct seeding. Direct seeding into plug trays is common in large operations. And if you look in the upper left, you can see that plug trays are available in a variety of different sizes. There are a number of tools used or available for direct seeding. And the seeding tools that are best suited to an individual operation is largely a function of the size. If we'll look at growers that are raising uh, a fair amount of transplants, it's common that they would use something like in the center right hand picture, which is a wand type seeder. And if we look at very large operations where we're growing hundreds of thousands of transplants a year, it is relatively common to see something like the Blackmore needle seeder in the bottom left. That particular seeder is basically a totally automated system. Once we set the plug tray in place, the seed is actually picked up, distributed onto the plug tray, and the plug tray is advanced and the cycle repeats itself. It is a beautiful system, but it's a very expensive piece of equipment that can only be justified by growers producing very large numbers of trains. After we've got our seed sown, then it's time to worry about the germination process. As we discussed earlier, proper temperature and moisture are critical for good seed germination. Large operations commonly have a room, in some cases a modified walk-in cooler, where higher than average temperatures and relative humidities can be maintained for good seed germination. Medium-sized growers may utilize purchased germinators like the one seen in the upper left. Small growers may utilize thermostatically controlled heat mats or heat cables and cover their flats with domes to maintain humidity like is seen in the bottom right. And please do not in any way be discouraged by trying to utilize the method in the bottom right. It's what I commonly use in IRAs many thousands of transplants every year with a high degree of success. Here's a couple of photos of some greenhouse growers that are germinating seed. The lower left shows the use of heating mats and one of the things I wanted to point out it's important that as we move on to these larger mats that we only keep species that have similar germination requirements on the same mat. In other words, one mat can only operate at one temperature and if you look in the lower left you can see that all of the plants on the mat were tomatoes. They were all germinated at the same temperature. The picture in the upper right shows a different grower and in this case we have buried heating cables that are again thermostatically controlled that are placed underneath of those trays. Do note in both cases how they've got plastic that can be placed over the flats prior to them actually germinating so that we can maintain the high relative humidity environment required for good seed germ. The upper left hand picture here shows the electric heating cables that are used for both hotbeds and used to place underneath of flats for growers that are germinating seed. These are available in a wide variety of lengths and wattages. The right hand picture is an example of a thermostat that would be used to control either heat mats or heat cables. The copper probe that you see is actually a thermocouple that is determining what the temperature is at. It is placed inside of a flat or a section of a flat that is filled with the same media that we're using to raise our seed and cap at the same moisture level. 
the thermostat plugs into the wall and the mat or heating cable plugs into the receptacles that you see on the surface of the box there. Another valuable tool for growers to have as they're trying to germinate seed, they must have a good soil thermometer so that they can place it into the flat and make sure that we're maintaining the proper temperature for optimal seed germination. And probably I should point out where growers typically get in trouble is that they check their systems and go out and put their thermometers in their flats at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when it's nice and sunny and warm in the greenhouse. But if we were to come back at 2 o'clock in the morning when the greenhouse is colder, we may find that the temperature that we're germinating our seed at is also gotten cooler. It is important that we have these systems be at this elevated temperature throughout the germination. Very soon after germination, in fact almost immediately, the flat containing the seedlings should be moved out of the germinating area and into the greenhouse. Failure to remove the seedlings from the germination area where we have high temperature and high relative humidity and typically low light intensity will result very quickly in stretched or what we call etiolated seedlings which are of inferior quality. Once we've got our seed germinated and the seedlings have been allowed to go on and develop in the greenhouse for uh, three or four days to a couple of weeks depending on what species that we're working with, it is now time to move the seedlings and actually pot them. In terms of growing transplants, there are a variety of materials that we can use that ranges from plastic to clay to peat but I do want to point out that the type of container used while it varies from grower to grower there are some universal truths one of them is that the size of the container must be large enough to support the finished transplant that we're planning on producing and secondly growers should be aware that a vast number of studies have been conducted and found in almost all cases a correlation that is well established between tomato transplant size and both early and overall production. And I think tomatoes being one of the most common crops raised, it's important to point that out. Here is just one of the many studies that have shown the impact of tomato transplant size on both early and, mark and total marketable yield. Larger transplant size equals greater yields. Going back to choices of container materials, plastic is probably the most commonly used material for growing transplants. It is economical, lightweight, can be reused, and it is available in almost every imaginable size and shape. The biggest problem with plastic materials for containers, especially for new growers, is that plastic tends to stay too wet and new growers tend to overwater, and so this can result in us producing lower quality transplants. If you look here is just a variety of plastic materials that can be used to raise transplants. Up in the top left hand corner is what's called a flat and in general we want to get flats that have holes in them. They come both with and without holes but we want ones that have holes so that they will drain. And they're called 1020 flats simply because they are 10 inches wide and 20 inches long. In the bottom left you're seeing one of the compact inserts that can go into a flat and these inserts come in almost every imaginable configuration in terms of size and the size of course of the individual cells will dictate how many of them fit on this sheet that entire sheet which fits back into a 1020 flat. Clay, which was quite popular 30 years ago, is very seldom used anymore. It's not used for a number of reasons. First, it's pretty expensive to buy clay. Clay is very heavy, 
and it's got to be handled with the plant and the media in it and it can become a little bit cumbersome. Clay is reusable and in fact to justify the expense associated with a clay pot it must be reused. The nice thing about clay is it's easy to keep dry and in some cases we do see some growers still using clay you know depending on the area you're in you might be able to pick them up at garage sales flea markets those kinds of places where they don't have such an initial input expense as they do if we were trying to raise or purchase them new the use of peak containers is increasing among growers the peak containers are not reusable but they are relatively cheap they are very grower friendly they're easy to keep dry and they are available in a wide variety of shapes and sizes not as many shapes and sizes as plastic but enough different shapes and sizes are available that it's likely you will find one that will suit your needs we saw previously that different media can result in different growth rates and growth levels what is most commonly used by growers in Illinois for transplant production is soilless mix and as we stated earlier typically it's soilless mix for the plug mix that we're going to purchase and also for the growing media that we're going to use to grow on this transplants again the biggest difference between plug mix and the growing media uh, normally plug mix is a much finer material this is a description of what could be found in ProMix and there are other brands ProMix is just one of them that is commonly used and with these soilless media the biggest ingredient in almost all cases is going to be peat moss then we will additionally have some perlite and vermiculite as well as some other materials that you see listed this is sort of the ingredients or the recipe for pro mix it's got 75 to 85 percent peat moss some perlite and vermiculite they add both dolomitic and calcitic limestone in order to adjust the pH to a level that is suitable for good plant growth Promix also contains a wetting agent making it easier to get the media wet the first time that we utilize it and some of the promixes also contain some biologically friendly organisms that may help reduce the incidence of certain seedling and transplant once we've got our container and our media is wetted up it is now time to actually go through and transplant and this is done with the process typically referred to as pricking off in the case of seeds that have been broadcast and if you'll look here the grower is doing a great job they're handling the little seedling by its cotyledons see how they've got a hold of just that little leaf there and they don't have a hold of the plant itself and typically this is going to be done just using a sharpened pencil growers should avoid grabbing their seedlings by the stem if you handle it by the stem it's likely you can damage the growing point and if that happens you will not have a viable transplant that will be produced for growers that are using plug trays it's difficult to dislodge those plugs those little plants out of the plug tray and again we just talked about we don't want to damage it by yanking on the seedling and so there are dislodgers that are available for medium and large size growers to use in this case the plug tray is set down the lid is closed the grower will hit the foot treadle that you see at the bottom center of the slide and all of those plugs will be dislodged in that flat at a single time smaller growers can accomplish the same task by simply getting a bolt that is of the correct diameter to fit through the bottom of the plug tray and simply knock each individual plug out with a bolt once the transplants have been potted they're ready to moved out to the greenhouse for growing on 
The left hand picture shows a well planned greenhouse that can be watered so that all of the plants are receiving the amount of water that they need. The picture on the right hand side shows too many types of plants in too small of an area. It will be difficult not to either over or under water some of these plants because of the great diversity of plant size and plant species being grown in this small area. Successful transplant growing requires several factors. First and foremost, water the plants only when needed. For more, far more plants are killed by overwatering than are killed by underwatering. Most growers use soilless media, which has little to no micronutrients associated with it and it is also important that we apply fertilizer on a weekly basis starting somewhere between the second and third week of growing. Good light quality is also important as well as maintaining proper temperature. It's good to have fans in the greenhouse if we can so that we have good air circulation. Good air circulation helps to perhaps strengthen plant stems and it also does help to reduce the incidence of many of the fungal diseases that may occur. It is also important to maintain proper plant spacing. As the plants grow, they may need to be spaced out further from one another. Again, most growers are going to be using soilless media and fertilizer applications are of paramount importance for successful transplant production. Most growers will use water soluble fertilizer for greenhouse transplant production. Organic growers may use fish emulsion or other soluble fertilizer forms. The water soluble fertilizer is typically injected into the irrigation system. The picture in the upper right hand corner shows a proportional injector that typically costs between $350 and $400. They are very precise. Some are adjustable in terms of the rate at which they inject. Others are fixed. In general, they run somewhere in the vicinity of about 100 to 1, meaning that for every 100 gallons of solution that flows out the end of our watering wand, one gallon of nutrient stock solution has been injected into that 100 gallon. The bottom right hand picture shows a cheaper but less accurate method of adding water soluble fertilizer to our irrigation water. It's sold by a couple of different names, sometimes called a hose-on, sometimes called a siphomix. These devices are typically somewhere around 20 to 1, depending on which particular one you have purchased. It will tell you on the package when you buy it. And they are often used by growers that are just getting started. They can't really justify the expense of a $300 injector, and they work okay. As growers get more experience and start raising a few more transplants, most of them will wind up ultimately moving to a proportional injector because of the greater accuracy. That This is a label from the Scott's 2020-20 picture that we saw in the previous slide. Notice that in addition to the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, it also contains a lot of different micronutrients. This is critical for successful transplant production if the grower is using soilless media. Again, soilless media lacks micronutrients and it, we must supply them in order to have good plant growth and development. Maintaining proper temperatures is also mandatory for producing high quality transplants. This table, and there are many others like it that can be found from a variety of sources, lists the optimal daytime and nighttime temperatures. Running daytime temperatures far in excess of those listed above will typically result in low quality transplants and running nighttime temperatures far below what is listed above may not negatively impact transplant quality but it will greatly lengthen the amount of time required to produce a transplant. And again, if you'll look, it varies a little bit. Some crops like cooler weather. Things like cruciferous crops are probably best at a daytime temperature of 65, where plants like tomatoes and peppers are probably better at a temperature of 70 degrees. 
Here are two tomato transplants. The transplant on the right, while shorter, is actually of higher quality. The lack of stretching in this transplant on the right will result in it likely having a higher survivability rate in the field and it will probably suffer less from transplant shock than its counterpart on the left. Here are some examples of poor quality transplants. The upper picture is showing plants that have weak stems and poor color. They are obviously lacking phosphorus fertilizer. You can see that by the purple color underneath the leaves and on the stem. And one would suspect that these plants were probably being grown both too wet and too cold. The bottom picture is showing plants that have stretched or have become etiolated. They were likely grown in a greenhouse that was run too warm and also too wet. If you look at that bottom picture, you'll see that notice how plants in the center of the flat are actually taller than those that are on the edge. The reason for that is that the center of the flat stays wetter. The edge is the first to dry out. Good quality transplants like those seen here will look like a cube. They're about as wide as they are tall and this is in the case of tomatoes. And it takes a variety of factors but growers can do this if they pay attention to the details. So again, sex, successful transplant production is the product of many factors. Among those, good sanitation, good light quality, and maintaining proper temperature regimes. What do we mean by good sanitation? We need to start with clean, disease-free seed or other propagules if we're doing something that's vegetatively propagated. Preferably, if we can, we would like them to be certified as being virus free. We need to disinfest or sterilize containers, tools, benches, other things that are going to contact the plants that we are raising. We don't want to allow our breaker or the end of our garden hose to lay on the ground. If we lay the end of the garden hose on the ground, we pick it back up. There's pathogens on the breaker. We turn on the water. We've now spread those pathogens from the ground up on top of our greenhouse bench. If we've got garbage cans in the greenhouse that contain plant debris, we want to have lids on those garbage cans. We don't want insect pests to be feeding on plant debris in the garbage can and then pick up disease and turn around and transfer that back out to our crop. In a similar reason, we would like to have no weeds in the greenhouse. Weeds can harbor viral diseases and they're also a good hiding place for insects. So we may treat all of the plants that are on our bench top, but if we don't treat the weeds below, then we still have an insect problem. This is easily dealt with by not allowing weeds to be present in the greenhouse. We should wash our hands if we're handling the plants in the greenhouse. This is especially important for tobacco users. And again, soilless media is a choice that affords us good sanitation. If we're going to be using soil based media, ideally we would like to have it be pasteurized prior to using it. One of the things that we haven't talked about yet and should is soil blocking. It's not overly commonplace, but there are a number of growers that use soil blocking for transplant production. And some of the reasons typically cited for why one would use soil blocks are listed here. They offer a good root environment, perhaps less air pruning or binding than what we would see if we were trying to raise in a cell. They have improved water holding capacity. We may have a reduced incidence of transplant shock. Normally if we're growing in soil, the plants can remain just a bit longer than if we were raising in trays and there tends to be less waste, less environmental impact from growers that are using soil blocks rather than those that are using other means. Here are some examples of the tools that can be used for making blocks 
and on the right hand side you'll see some tomato transplants that are being grown in soil blocks that have been made with these tools. You can see here pre-doubled soil blocks that were just made ready to accept the seed uh, and we would plant directly into each individual, we would direct seed into each individual soil block. There are systems available where the blocks that we just saw can be moved up into larger blocks. If you'll look here, when we make these bigger blocks, we make a dibble that is capable of re accepting the initial block that we were growing in. So we move them up with very little shock from uh, the potting them up to a larger transplant size. If we're going to do soil blocking, most of the time we're going to make a mix that is capable of forming good blocks. It's got enough water holding capacity, it's got enough firmness that once we make this block it sticks together and will stay stuck together throughout the life of the transplant production period. There are several different mixes or recipes for making a good soil block mix. One of them is listed here. Organic growers that are using soil blocking, this is a recipe that you can use and we don't have to use soil blocking. There are other organic potting soils that are available or growing media that are available, but we do see several of the organic growers using um, soil blocking as the method they rely on for their transplant production. Well, we've got our transplants growing on in our greenhouse. They've been potted up, life's good, and now we kind of take inventory and look and see how much seed do we have left over. It's pretty common that we will have ordered too much seed of some of the things that we are growing, and so we're going to have to store that seed. How long we can store seed varies from species to species, and there are lots of charts that show seed longevity. Again, Knott's Vegetable Growers Handbook has a great chart inside of it that tells you how long are vegetable seeds of different species viable for. If we're going to store seed, we should typically store it so that the sum of the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and relative humidity in percentage be near 80. So in other words, something like a 40 degree refrigerator at 40% relative humidity is a good storage environment for many types of seeds. Ideal storage conditions for individual seeds again are available in Knott's Vegetable Growers Handbook. Do be aware that with some species seed may only be usable for one or two years. With other species seed can be successfully stored for 10 years or more brought back out and be perfectly fine in terms of its percent germination. There will be a slight decline with time for all species, but some of them that decline occurs over a very long period of time. Uh, again with others, maybe two years is all you can save the seed. Well, as our plants are growing on in the greenhouse, it's also time to start scouting for diseases and pests that may be present. Among pests, aphids, thrips are very common. Slugs can occasionally be a problem. Insects, slugs uh, can both be addressed with either synthetic or organic pesticides for growers that have outbreaks of these particular problems. For viral diseases, probably our best defense against viral diseases is by not ever having the virus present. That means that we would rely on a couple of things. One, buying certified virus free seed and secondly we would like to have varieties that are virus resistant 
meaning that we don't bring them in the virus into the greenhouse and even if it were in the greenhouse the varieties that we are raising are resistant thrips is a major greenhouse pest and in, it can not only cause damage by its feeding but thrips are also capable of transmitting some diseases their management requires great vigilance and it will likely require relying on more than a single pest control strategy we are having to utilize both uh, the use of beneficial insects and also some chemical control in order to maintain thrips populations at levels that we feel are uh, low enough to allow for good plant growing conditions. Although there are many diseases that can be problematic for growers raising transplants, more common ones are listed above. Damping off or water molds and botrytis can be common problems in greenhouses. Occasionally Phytophthora can also be a problem. The first line of defense a grower should use is maintaining an environment that is not conducive or is less favorable for development of these diseases. This means that we're going to not overwater and we're going to control the relative humidity inside of the greenhouse and raise our transplants at the desired temperature. In addition to these good cultural conditions that we want to supply the plants with, we also need to practice good sanitation. Greenhouse should be, uh, again, maintained with proper temperature, proper relative humidity, good sanitation, and should we still have a problem after practicing all of these good cultural techniques, then we can always come back and also utilize either synthetic or organic fungicides to help control the problem. When disease does occur, growers should consider roguing affected plants and then moving adjacent plants to an area that is free from similar species, kind of develop a quarantine area for plants to make sure that this disease doesn't continue to proceed all the way across the greenhouse bench. Good disease control requires, again, you know, growers maintain good cultural practices and the use of organic or synthetic pesticides and we do also want to rogue and dispose of affected plants as soon as they become prior to field planting transplants should be allowed a period to harden off while historically this involved placing plants on a wagon that can be rolled in and out of a protected structure like a machine shed or other building with many of the greenhouses today the sides can either be raised or lowered if the sides of the greenhouse can be opened and closed then we can conduct this hardening off process right inside the greenhouse the process should begin by reducing the frequency of water and allowing the plants some exposure to wind hardening off plants um, requires a period of a few days to maybe as much as a week or 10 days depending on what species that we're using and how soft the transplant was prior to beginning this process. Plants that are hardened off have better survivability and are less subject to transplant shock. Some considerations for field planting select only the healthiest transplants and set them out at the appropriate time. Care should be taken to make sure that the newly set transplants have good root soil contact and normally plants are watered in immediately after setting to help ensure that we do have good root soil contact. For many crops it is also common that this water that is used to water in the transplants may contain a water soluble plant starter type fertilizer. Following these steps it may also following these steps may also help improve transplant survivability 
and reduce transplant. There are many types of machines that are available to assist in the transplanting process, such as this water wheel setter, which is pictured above. A water wheel setter and most types of mechanical transplanting equipment allow for the application of water or water and fertilizer solution immediately at the time of transplanting. There are devices that are both capable of planting on bare ground or for plastic culture systems. The use of tractor drawn mechanical equipment does require that the beds be laid out such that the tractor can be driven over the top of the beds and it also requires that field conditions at time of planting be such that to, it will allow for a tractor to be driven. In other words, if we're going to rely on a tractor drawn mechanical transplanter to help us, we may not be able to plan on some days because the field is simply too muddy to operate. Smaller growers that are going to plant by hand may also use equipment such as you're seeing in the right hand side of this slide which will help to mark the holes. This hole marking allows us to have uniform plant spacing within the row while allowing us to not rely on a tape measure. It allows the transplanting process to proceed at a much more rapid pace than if we're out there trying to manage the planting with a tape measure. We simply pull the device down through the field, it marks where each individual plant goes, and we can then come back in and rapidly hand set the plants in each of the marks that has been made. Here are some additional aids that can be used for field planting. And again, in these cases, um, you know, in the upper right is a device sold by Johnny's that is used to help set pots like uh, a three or four inch tomato transplant. Field planting works best if we have all straight rows and row spacing both in and between row spacing should be appropriate for the crop being raised. Transplants should be set at the proper depth and the field should be soil sampled and amended as needed prior to planting. Some growers may also use row covers on their planting. Row covers can be used for a couple of different reasons. One is to provide a slight degree of frost protection and it is also useful for some crops to help reduce insect pest problems. For example, if we're setting cucurbits, cucumbers, or muskmelon, immediately after setting we may drag lightweight row covers over the top of the crop and those row covers will stay in place and it will help protect the crop from cucumber beetle. They stay in place all the way up to the point where the crop begins to bloom. Once the cucurbits start to bloom, the row covers have to be removed so that the bees have access to flowers so that they can pollinate the crop and we can have successful crop production. Like in most endeavors, success occurs when preparation meets opportunity. This means planning is a critical part of a successful venture. We must be sure that we have a sufficient variety of crops across the entire time period that our customers are wanting to purchase them. To spread the harvest over several weeks, we can rely on a couple of different strategies. One, we can select early, mid, and late maturing varieties of the individual crop that we are wanting to raise. And additionally, we can make successive plantings of the crop across the planting window so that we harvest over a much longer period of time. Planning considerations include when do I want to plant? How long does it take to make a transplant? How much do I need to plant? And how many plantings are, am I going to make? The first year that you're in your enterprise, this will be largely a guess on the part of you. 
It is critical, however, that we have good record keeping and we need to take notes in a journal so that the following year we can capitalize on our successes and minimize those things that didn't work out quite as well as we might have liked. In some cases, such as if you're selling subscriptions to a CSA, the grower may have a pretty concrete idea of the amount of produce that they need and the time in which they need it. This allows us to very precisely plan what it is that we're going to need to plant on a weekly basis. Tools for crop planning can be created by a grower using just any common spreadsheet or we may purchase existing software programs or apps that can help in our planning process. Again, regardless of how it is that we're doing our planning, for it to be best, it needs to be in conjunction with really good record keeping. By this really good record keeping, it ensures that the mistakes we make on year one are not necessarily repeated on the second year. There are a variety of additional resources that help with <clears throat> everything that we've talked about in this presentation today. Here are some. Here are some additional resources that are available online and some even more resources. So there's lots of material available out there. I hope that this presentation helped you get to thinking and get your thoughts ready to start being a good transplant grower. Happy transplanting. Here are a couple of websites that could be of interest to you. One is the Illinois SARE site, the other is the Illinois Small Farm site, and they have a variety of information available on each of these. If you have any additional questions, here is contact information for all the people involved in developing and or reviewing uh, this presentation. Thank you for your time, and again, happy successful transplant production.